Hi, and welcome to Connecting a Better World, where we spend time meeting some of the most incredible human beings who make this world a better place. We will learn how each individual took their ideas, mission, and purpose to create and serve others in business and organizations that surround social good, social entrepreneurship, and social impact, and find out how we, together, can further connect others to help. I am your host, Dr. Natalie Phillips. Today, we will be talking with Chris Williams, president at God's Garage, located in Conroe, just north of Houston, Texas. God's Garage is a nonprofit garage filled with a group of people who want to help others. God's Garage was born out of the needs they witness as they are dedicated to repair vehicles for single mothers, widows, and wives of deployed military who may be struggling to make ends meet. They have also found those who may be in need of a vehicle but are not at the place where they can purchase one. Through donated cars and parts, God's Garage is able to bridge troubled times in so many people's lives by giving away vehicles to qualifying recipients. I wanted to welcome you, and I'm so thankful that you could join me. I first heard about you from our mutual friend, Lisa Copeland. She's a good friend of mine. And on Uh one of her shows, she was talking about how she is setting up Cars Her Way and how she stumbled across God's Garage. So tell me a little bit more about how you met Lisa and more about your story about God's Garage. Lisa found us through a friend who is also a client of hers a local car dealer and the car dealer actually said have you heard of this god's garage and sent her a link and so she looked us up and she actually came over i didn't get to meet her in person i was out on a pickup and she got to see the place and talk to some of our volunteers and contacted me and said we need to work together (laughs) i said well that would be great started really finding out who she was and how important a person she is and what a difference she's making in ladies' lives. And I thought, well, this is the perfect partnership because this is what she's about and it's what we're about. So God's Garage started almost 18 years ago in my garage at the house and just fixing cars for ladies that didn't have enough money to get their car fixed. We did brakes and starters and little things like that. And it was only supposed to be just a group of my friends getting together every once in a while. And it was about every two months. Well, that turned into every two weeks, which turned into twice a week. And two and a half years ago, we went full time. So when you started this in your garage 18 years ago, was it on the side of something else that you were doing? I mean, did you have another job? Was it something that you were thinking? I've been a children's pastor and youth pastor, adult pastor, missions pastor. And that was my career. And that's what I thought I would be doing for the rest of my life. I actually don't like working on cars. Oh my goodness. Not one of my favorite things. And it's something I know how to do. And it's one of those things that I felt God was saying, what's in your hand to do? How can you help people? Well, I teach and I preach and I counsel. And it was just a constant nudge. And finally, I felt I'm supposed to go after this garage full time. And I thought, well, there's no way. Because, you know, I funded the garage. And if I quit my job, Who's going to fund the garage? And what am I going to do? Just work every day by myself in my house? And God had bigger plans, that's for sure. So we're off to the races now. We are actually purchasing 13 acres on uh, one of our major roadways here. And it already has five outbuildings. So we are doing a major expansion. We have another location in Utah, and we're looking at opening three to four this next year Oh my goodness. Uh, across the, the states. My goal is to get one of these in every state and then two and three and four. We just want to show people how to do what we're doing and teach them and give them the tools and set them free. Wow. What types of services do you do and how do you get referrals? I mean, because starting 18 sure. years ago, you know, once every two months and then now to where it's grown, I'm assuming yeah. a lot of word of mouth. But also, where are people finding you? How do they find you? Social media and the internet have been really large. We um, kept this pretty quiet because I was afraid to keep having to turn people away and finally decided, you know what, we need to let more people know. So when we went to full time, I contacted two TV stations in Houston and said, by the way, 
we're over here and this is what we're doing. One of them called me within 15 minutes and said, can we come to a story today? I turned into every channel news show in Houston, turned into People Magazine and NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, my gosh. On and on. And it's just kind of snowballed. And I'm getting emails from Paris and El Salvador and Puerto Rico and all over where they're seeing these rebroadcasts of these news segments where we've given cars away on air and shown the stories of some of our ladies. We're looking at doing a reality show. There's a, a prominent automotive network that's kind of courting us. We just filmed a, a Korean TV show where we're constantly filming around here for, for little media events. And I'm not big on the whole being recognized thing. It's kind of funny to go through all of that, but they hear about us from these different programs. They have to apply online and they get vetted through our process. We try to ensure that we really are meeting their needs and find out what's really going on in their lives. And so we call references. And after they get through that process, they get invited to our classes that are mandatory. And we teach budgeting. We teach life skills and single parenting skills. We help with job interviews. And we actually partnered with our local food bank. And with each car that we give away, we also give away 25 pounds of groceries. Wow. And we have a clothing ministry that comes in and provides business attire so that they can take their newfound skill sets and go interview for jobs. We have a photographer doing professional headshots. We have an insurance company that comes in and helps them get insurance. We have a bank that sets up free checking accounts for them. And it's a holistic approach to helping them get to the next level in their lives. And transportation is huge, of course. If you don't have a car, you can't get a job. And if you don't have a job, you can't get a car. And so, especially in the suburbs where there's no metro or mass transit, it's a big deal. It's independence and it's freedom. And getting a car is a big deal. But the skill sets that we get to impart that some of our ladies have missed for whatever reason, buoys them beyond anything a car could do. It really teaches them how to get out of some of the cyclical living that they've been in and the hopelessness and the helplessness they felt goes away as they realize they can be empowered. And it's mainly through volunteers that work with us. We only have two full-time positions in the company and two part-time positions. Everyone else is volunteer. That's incredible. I'm just thinking as you're describing some of the things that you probably never imagined you would have at your fingertips. I'm just imagining a huge group of people that now, starting from your garage, this has grown into. So I have this question that I was going to ask because I was thinking about how you did come from a background of service as a pastor, and especially because you said that you're not really that interested in fixing cars. It's something that you do, but you're not like Mm -hmm. you get super excited about it. How much did you fight? Because I know that if you don't give in, God's just going to take that hammer and just hit you over the head again and say, excuse me, um, this is what you're supposed to be doing, right? Yeah, that's great. That's funny that you think that you're going to be able to do this, but this is what I have in store for you. So like how much did you fight? And Mm -hmm. even though things were probably put in your path of look right in front of you, look, I am providing this for you. When are you going to believe me that this is going to be something huge? Like I want to hear that part of the story too. Well, it is interesting that no matter how many times God takes us to another level in our lives, provides for us, when we follow his path, things open up. No matter how many times that happens, we tend to forget about it and brush it aside. And so although God's shown up in my life so many times over and over, with this move, I was fighting against it. In fact, I live in a neighborhood and been doing this at my house, and I said, God, I can't do another night at my house with a dozen cars parked out front and we're working on cars all into the night this would have to be full time and we can't do that because i don't have the money for a place and so i started looking around and i'll show you god how expensive it is because obviously you don't know i'm not real intelligent you know so i start looking at places going "Uh uh-huh uh-huh i told you i told you god (laughs) and i was frustrated and i finally said okay god I'm going to look at this last place that I see right here, and then I'm done, and I'm going to go and get another job and just go on with my life. Mm -hmm. And so this building was for lease, and I pulled up, and I called a number, and the guy told me all about it and how much it was. 
it was too much. Of course, anything was too much at that point. And I said, okay, thank you very much. And I tried to hang up and he says, wait, 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 wait. What do you want to use this for? And I said, well, I run this thing called God's Garage. He says, I know who you are. I've been wanting to come volunteer. Stay there. I'm on my way. And he hung up. Oh, my gosh. And I thought, great. Now oh. I get to say no to his face. Oh, my this gosh. Fun. So he shows up and we walk around and he reiterates how much he gets for rent. And there's just no way. And he finally says, if you guys want to use this place, yes, I get this for rent. But I get this is my mortgage payment, and if you just pay my mortgage payment, it's yours to use. And God said, yes. And I thought, <laughs> God, I don't have the down payment or the first month. And I stuck out my hand, and I shook his hand, and I said, okay. And he said, okay, here's the keys, and we'll do paperwork and all that later. Move in. Oh. Well, by the next oh. evening, I had the first month rent and the down payment for what? the, the – deposit and god has shown himself true at every step right in the nick of time even moving to this new property 13 acres is a big deal especially on the major roadway that it's on and it's a lot of money and it's a lot of responsibility and i said god unless you make a way there's no way and this is called god's garage because it's god's it's not mine mm -hmm. and if it's god's then he has to resource it and he has to maintain it and supply and we convinced somehow my real estate agent to go and talk to the seller and convince them to let us put a contingency down and do a, a due diligence. And so we go through the process. We're six days from the 90-day extension they gave us, and it's almost up, and I don't have a down payment. I don't have anything. And I thought, okay, God, well, what did I learn through this process? And a guy came in, and he said, what's keeping you from this property you told me about? And I said, well, uh, down payment <laughs> Just for, for one thing. And he said, how much? And I told him, and it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he wrote a check and oh said, my gosh. you're supposed to be there. Then I say, okay, my real estate agent guy, call the seller. He says, they're not going to extend this contract. They're not going to do it. There's a lot of activity on this property. I'll call them. Let's pray. So we prayed. He calls them. He calls me back, and he says, I need your board members. I need the bank that said they would try to work with you, and I need you at the property in an hour and a half. The seller wants to meet with us. So we show up. The seller ends up telling us how much he wants us to have this property, and he says, I will make the first year's mortgage payments for you. I will give you the cash to put in the bank to make every payment for the first year. Wow. From the seller. Again, God continues to show up as we take the steps, and it's taking those steps that are the hardest thing because you don't see what's going to happen, and you don't know what's going to happen, and it's such a faith thing. But when God tells you to do something, you've got to just step out and do it and say, okay, God, if you want to teach me something through this, then I'm going to learn. If you want to make this happen, then I'm going to walk through the door. But if you don't want me in the door, close the door. And that's my prayer always mm -hmm. as, as I make these decisions. If you don't want me in there, close the door. If you want me in there, you're going to have to open the door, mm -hmm. not me. Do you feel that because you've gone through this and you continue to grow through this and your faith must be busting at the seams, but do you still walk through that doubt or do you think that your faith has gone stronger of, no, seriously, I am going to step out because I know he's going to provide. Do you think that it's been getting easier to it's, do that? It's gotten better, and the more that I hear God's voice and listen to God's voice, the easier it becomes, and it's still a faith step. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still have doubts. Our enemy wants to make us doubt every move that's going to be good for us and others through us, so he tries to put it in there, and I just I say, look, if this is God's voice, then he's making a way, and here we go. And yeah, it gets a little easier, and it's like listening to his voice, you know, mm -hmm. You called me on the phone tomorrow and say, hey, it's me, I probably would go, who? <laughs> who are you? But if we talk every day, you know, if Lisa calls you, you're going to go, hey, Lisa. All she has to say is, what's up, or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. You know it's her because you recognize her voice. It's the same with God. The more we learn to listen, the more we recognize his voice, the easier it becomes to obey and to just step out. Now, you have 
such a passion to give back to others. And a lot of it has come from what you did before as a pastor. But I saw a story actually on your website, and I didn't know if it was your story or not. But my question is, where do you think this passion came from to serve and give back to others? I very early on had some issues with my car and needed help. And I was working two jobs and going to college full time as well. So I was sleeping two hours a night and just doing everything I could to make ends meet. And I was complaining one day because my car wasn't running and I needed to fix it and I didn't have money for parts. And I said, God, why is that there's somebody that can help me? You know, some kind of program, something. And God, in his whispering way, said in my spirit, what are you doing to help other people? And that really started a life song for me. And I found it's nice to have stuff. It's nice to have a good house and car and clothes and everything else. It's great. Uh, Nothing wrong with that. But when I help someone else, there's a hole that's in me that gets fulfilled in such a deep, meaningful way that nothing can compare to it. Not a new car, not a new job, nothing can compare. And we all have that hole within us because we weren't made to be islands and just take care of ourselves. We were made to work together and, and help each other. And that's really one of our messages here is just step out. There's something in your hand that you can do. And it may not be your favorite thing. It may be. But step out and help someone. And then what if you get a few people to do it with you? Imagine the difference you can make. And so that's how we did this. Now we have 120, 130 volunteers that are regulars that are doing the same thing with us. And, man, we're making a big difference. Next year, we will probably give away about 300 cars from this location next year. Wow. That's incredible. And repair another couple of hundred cars as well. So it's because other people have gone, you know what? What's in my hand to do? I want to band together with other people. And we have people from all walks of life, from all walks of faith. We have atheists. We have agnostics. We've had Muslims and Christians, and we don't discriminate who we give a vehicle to or who we try to help. We also don't discriminate as to who can come in and work with us. We do a background check, of course. You know, we make sure everything's safe, but we're all just God's people. It doesn't matter Mm -hmm. where we come from or even what we believe. God can use all of us. Absolutely. Now, did you grow up giving back and Was it something that your parents kind of got you involved in early on? Oh, my gosh. We would be on the way to church in the rain, dressed up. And if someone was on the side of the road, my dad would pull over. We would jump out, put the spare tire on or try to get the car running and show up to church a little late and really wet because my dad felt the same way. We've got to help people. I've got a little bit of skill in this area. I'm going to use it and help with somebody else. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ignore other people and concentrate and focus on myself. So yeah, I grew up thinking this is what we should do. And thankfully, my two girls who are grown and one of them's married with my grandson and another's going to be married probably within this next year. And they feel the same way. They are out to spend their lives on other people. What is one of the most memorable stories of your journey that has impacted you? There's so many. I end up crying every time we give a vehicle away because it's so impactful. But the one that got me the most was I was giving this lady this big town car, this nasty looking thing, but it ran great. But you could probably put 10 people in it. And it's one of those long boats. And I'm giving her the keys and she's crying and I'm crying and the kids are crying. There's three kids. And I have this brief thought, the kids are crying because mom's crying and this strange guy here is crying and right about that moment this little girl she's got to be nine years old and she's got huge crocodile tears just flowing down her face and she looks up at these big dark eyes and she grabs my shirt and she says mister and I looked at her and I said what babe she says do you realize this means mommy can take me to the store and to the doctor And I thought, no child should ever need to know what it's like not to be able to get to the store, Mm -hmm. not to be able to get to the doctor. Then nobody wants to go to the doctor. And yet she feels this as a child. So 
So what we do is so important, not just for the ladies, but for the families and the extended families. They're going to be these kids growing up, and they're going to be 50 years old one day telling people the story of how they grew up with a single mom, and they didn't have any money, and they didn't have a car, and some people gave them a car and changed the course of their life. What more can we do with our lives than spend it on someone else like that and create a legacy? And I feel like these things are happening in our backyard, and we're not always privy to what's going on. So when somebody stops you like that, like a nine-year-old girl, and says that to you, you know why you're doing it, but at the same time, it becomes so real that you're just like, wait, what? This shouldn't be happening in our country where we are so abundant, and it is. So it sounds like what you're doing and the way that you have been able to have, or actually I'm going to change it, the way that you've been blessed to have the media coverage that you have had and now this growth of your passion into something that you really want to get in every single state. Would you Mm -hmm. start thinking about working with people in these states that may be doing something very similar to you? And would you start there to talk to them about, hey, this is what's going on and how we do it, and we don't know if it's something that you want to kind of be part of? Or would you just start something new in every state? Because I do know, like I'm in Colorado, and I do know that there is somebody here that does it at my kid's school. It's a private Christian school, and they had a date where volunteers came and they did repairs on cars and the school is really near an auto parts store. And so it was literally running back and forth on that date that everybody had reserved to do that. It might not necessarily be the way you're doing it, but in order for you to move the needle forward, what are some things that you're thinking about in how to grow this or how to let God lead you into reaching every single state here? We have actually started licensing. It's kind of franchising for nonprofits. And it's not a monetary thing. You don't have to pay dues or a franchise fee or anything like that. We start showing people how to do what we're doing, how to raise funds, how to spread the word, how to vet people. We give them all of our policies and procedures. We try to connect them to all of our vendors and get them discounts. Uh, We do really good training with them. And we teach them how to do it in a scalable way. So we can teach them how to start in a garage at their house or at a friend's garage and then grow as big as they want or that God wants. But we are offering that now. We've got a few in the pipeline. And then the one in Ogden, Utah is up and running very well right now. So if somebody was interested and they're listening to this and they're like, wow, I mean, did you just say that I could just start this in my garage and maybe I would just start it like how you did, just on the side and get some friends to do it? Would they just reach out to you and contact you and you would be able to at least direct them into, hey, look, I've done this before. Let me tell you how it worked for me so that you don't have to go through some of the things that I had to do. Definitely. And we've learned so much. I've been in ministry for 26, 27 years and I still didn't know so much about how to do this until we actually started doing it. So I can save a lot of heartache and I can teach them some easier ways to go about it. But yeah, man, they full-time job, dad, husband, and you can still do this out of your garage, off your driveway and help people. And I can show them how to do it. So just contact us. Wow. That is awesome. That is amazing. Is there anything else about God's garage that you would like to share? Yeah, if you think about us, pray for us that we listen to God's guidance, His wisdom, that the right people come along that are supposed to partner with us, and that we inspire people as we're helping, because that's what we want to be about. And the big overarching message, again, do something to help somebody. You don't have to wait till you win the lottery or quit your job or anything else. Just start doing it. Do whatever you can, whatever's in your hand. Start small. And then start gathering people to do it with you. I love that. I love that. And I feel just meeting you, even though it was just over the podcast here, I have been super blessed by learning about what you do. And I am so thankful that you you. agreed to jump on this show with me so that I can highlight you and what you're doing and really what God's doing working in your life and how you're really living in that faith and that purpose. Well, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And I enjoyed it.
doing this, I quit my job and I worked for free for the first year, two and a half years ago. Second year, I worked for half what I needed to pay my bills with. And this year, starting in January, I actually started receiving a real paycheck. I knew it was what we were supposed to do. And, yeah. and I had done contracting on the side for years. And so I had lots of toys and live in a nice house. So I just started selling stuff off. So I sold some cars and I sold some bikes and mm-hmm. used some plastic. And, you know, we did what we had to do because I was firmly convinced this is what I'm supposed to do. And so vacations were one of the things that we're not going to be doing. Well, we just went to Telluride for a week, stayed in a five-star resort, and everything was paid for by a friend. I'm a giver. I have a hard time receiving. And so I'm learning. This is something that you are getting better at accepting and having this faith and stepping out. But it's the same thing Mm. that you just said about receiving this gift from somebody too. God is trying to show you that, hey, I told you I was going to take care of you. And I know that you said no vacations, nothing. You know, this is what I'm going to do. But I am telling you that you can still be blessed by doing something like this as well. Yeah, I'm learning. Well, thank you so much. You are such an incredible human being. And thank you so much for (laughs) being who you are and really accepting what God has placed on your plate for you and your life. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. 